Okay, we're starting with proofs now. We're going to start with some really simple proofs. And remember, a proof is when you take an argument, like you see here on the left side of the screen. This is supposed to be a D, by the way, not an O. But when you take an argument and you prove that the conclusion follows from the premises. So how do you do that? Well, you use valid inferences, um, these rules of implication over here, and you apply them to the premises to get the conclusion, which is T in this case. And if you do that, then the argument must be valid. If you can't do it, it might be invalid, right? It, but um, you would want to check it with the truth table. So let's take a look at this. One strategy is look at the conclusion, which is T, and find it in the premises, and think about how you could get it, applying these rules over here. So we see that the conclusion is T, and we have D, not F, F or um, if D, then T. So if we could get if D, then T, and then get D, then we would get T, right? But how do we get if D, then T? Well, this is a wedge here, so we have to get not F. But look, we have not F. Okay? So that's one way you can kind of talk it out and get to the uh, answer. Now I just need to write it out. So we're going to do 4. Okay. Now we have 1 is F and 2 is not F, right? 1 is F or blah, 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 and 2 is not F. Now this little wedge, we have disjunctive syllogism. We can apply a disjunctive syllogism here. Okay? And what we would get is if D, then T. And I did that by looking at premise 1 and 2 and applying, oops, there we go, <laughs> the rule called disjunctive syllogism. Okay? So there we go. And now we want to get T, and we have if D, then T. When the conclusion is a consequent of a conditional, then you know that if you can get the antecedent, then you can just apply modus ponens. Okay? And if you don't know that, you just need to practice. Okay? <laughs> this is all about practice time. Okay? So uh, we have 3 and 4. 3 and 4 that we're going to use. So D is true, and if D, then T is true. Therefore, from 3 and 4, we can apply modus ponens. Okay, modus ponens is over here. It's always a valid rule of inference, and we got T. Okay, there you go. We did our first proof. Okay. Again, a strategy is to find the conclusion and the premises and work from there. Um, when you see a little wedge, maybe you can use a disjunctive syllogism rule, this rule over here. When you see a conditional, maybe you can use modus ponens or modus tollens. Okay. If you see more than one conditional, maybe you can use hypothetical syllogism. And you'll learn these little strategies as you get more and more practice. Okay. Let's do this one, and I'm not going to look at the rules. I'm going to do it blindfolded. Okay. <laughs> um, here we go. Actually, we should pull up the rules. I can point them out as we go through. Okay. So. There's the argument, and we have not k as the conclusion. So I'm going to use the same strategy, look for k. Notice k is in premise 1. So if I could get j, then I could get if k, then l. And then maybe I could use modus tollens if I had not l to get not k. Maybe that'll work. Let's try it. Okay. Now the first thing I want to get, though, is j. And we have l or j, and then not l. Hopefully, you'll see with some practice that you can get J from those two, okay, using a disjunctive syllogism. And if you don't see it, just look at the rules and start randomly applying them <laughs> to the premises until you see something that works, okay? Um, so we have um, uh, J, and we got that from 2 and 3, okay? And that is the rule of disjunctive syllogism, okay? DS. All right. So now that we have j, we can use j and 4 and 1 okay, to get if k, then l. Okay? So we have if k, then l. And how did I get that? Again, I saw that if only I had j, I could apply modus ponens. And now I do have j. So 1 and 4, modus ponens. And there you have it. Um, it's really simple from here. Um, and if you don't think it's so simple, maybe you can just randomly apply rules. So can we apply modus ponens anywhere? Well, no, we don't have a K. Can we apply modus tollens anywhere? Okay. 
we see we have if k then l oh look we do have a not l so yes we could apply modus tollens okay and we would get not k oops there we go so not k and we we used um, number three and number five to get not k okay and that's modus tollens so there you go, our second simple proof. <laughs> okay, We've done it. We've proven that not K must be true if these premises are true. Okay, Therefore, this is a valid argument. All right, let's look at another one. Um, whoops, I hit the internet there. Oh, great. Let me close that out. Okay, so proof two. This one looks a little longer. Yeah, I'm going to... Um, make this a little smaller for you. Again, have your rules out. There's eight rules actually. You see some of them there. Okay. Now I have not C. I could find the conclusion in the premises again and try to work from there. Um, the only place C is is way up here. And if I could isolate if C then not D, and then if I could get not not D, then I could get not C using modus tollens over here. But we would have to get rid of all of this stuff. So I would have to get not E. I do have not E down here. Um, but before I could do that, I would have to get H to get all of this. right? So maybe I should look for H. Now, if you didn't follow all that, your alternative, what you could do, is just randomly apply the rules and see what works. So let's go over to modus ponens. Let's pretend I don't have a clue. If P, then Q. Okay. If H, then blah, blah, blah. But I don't have H. Oh, but I could get H. Look. Okay. But, you know, um, with number 3 and 4, I could get H. But if you didn't see it, you just keep applying the rules, and you would eventually see that DS works, and then maybe it would make sense. Okay. So, number 5, I'm going to get H, and I'm going to use 3 and 4. Okay. And 3 and 4... Um, and that is a disjunctive syllogism, right? Let me, um, okay, there we go. Three and four, disjunctive syllogism. Cool. Now that we have H, we can apply it to premise one. So we're going to use five and one, and we're going to use modus ponens, right, to get that whole bit up here, which is... I'm doing this in paint, so it's a little <laughs> hard to write this out, but not E. Then, um, if C, then not D. Okay. So I'm getting closer to that not C, but I'm not there yet. Because now, I want to get not E so I can isolate this C, if, if C, then not D. And that's easy enough, um, because we already have not E up there. So I'm going to combine 4 and 6. Okay. 4. It's getting really messy. And 6. Simple modus ponens. Okay. Or you could put 6 and 4. I don't care. <laughs> okay. And you get um, if C. Um, I believe this is correct, right? Uh, let me make sure I got this. Yeah. Um, if C, then not D. There you go. Okay, so we're getting pretty close. We want to get not C, and we have this conditional now. Um, so how are we going to get that? Well, perhaps if we had not not D, we could use modus tollens to get not C. Do we have not not D? Well, no, we don't. But maybe we could get it somehow and we can look at number two if we could get not e we could get not not d or d and we do have not e right here so i'm going to do two and four modus tollens two and four modus tollens okay and two and four modus tollens will give me not not d which is the same as d i'm going to skip the little step where you move not not d to d Okay. Now that we have, well, let's go ahead and put not not d because we're going to need it for. There's two little knots there. Okay, that's two and four. And then finally, 
Okay. We apply the not not d to number seven. So we have we're going to apply eight and seven or seven and eight. Don't worry about the order. And we have um, that's modus tollens. Okay. And we have not not. Um, I'm sorry, not c. We've done it. We've proved that you can validly infer the conclusion from the premises. So this is a valid argument. Um, now, when you're looking at arguments like this, notice if there's a negated letter, and the letter C, when not negated, is the antecedent of a conditional, like right here in 7, then you know you can probably use modus tollens. And uh, Hurley in his book will give you little pieces of advice like that. But I think the best way to learn those strategies is just to practice these problems over and over again. And you'll learn them for yourselves, and you can look at Hurley's um, like 20 strategies or whatever. Um, but it's best to discover them for yourselves and then reinforce your learning by reading Hurley's strategies. Okay, so there you have it. We've done three proofs. And uh, let me see. We do have time for one more, I believe. Let's do this one. Okay. I'm trying to prove F. I have if A, then F and E. That would be nice. Um, when you have just a letter, you can probably get it from simplification if there's a conjunction with F in it. But first we have to get A. But we don't have A yet. Okay, but we can get A and C if we... So let's do this. Uh, 1 and 3. Okay. 1 and 3. Whoops. And this would be uh, modus ponens. Okay. And that gives us A and C. Okay. Whoops. Okay, <laughs> it's A and C. Um, okay, we're closer, All right? Um, now A and C though, we want to get A so we can get F and E. Okay, but uh, we have A and C, and we need A for the number two. So I'm going to combine four and two. Okay, so we have four and two. Um, I'm sorry. Let's just do four, and let's do this simplification, and that'll give us um, A. Awesome. And then we combine 5 and 2, or 2 and 5, whatever you want to do. That's supposed to be a 2, that's supposed to be a 5, um, and that's modus ponens. And um, 4 and 5, yeah, that's right, okay. Um, so 2 and 5, modus ponens, and um, that gives us F and E. And remember, we're trying to get F. And now it's pretty simple. Okay. How do we get F from this? Well, you can just simplify 6. Whoops, that's supposed to be an F. <laughs> and then we put 6, and we got that through simplification. So there you have it. Uh, three or four proofs. I think it was four proofs, yeah. Um, and you're just using those eight rules right now. Um, and there's an art to this. You know, there will be problems where uh, some of you, it takes you 12 steps to solve it. And uh, some of you might do the same in uh, four steps or six steps, you know. Uh, so one proof is more elegant than the other, but they're both equally valid. They're both 100% correct. <laughs> okay. So um, there is an art to this as well as it's not just mechanical sort of stuff. And... Um, Remember, look for the conclusion in the premises, look at those strategies, and I'll put up some more in later videos. Okay? Uh, thanks.